Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Augsburg University's Daily Chapel today. Um, I'm just going to do this because I know they're going to try and surprise me. Today is my birthday. <laughs> that's, that's why we have. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but if you do not have a palm, please raise your hand. And one of our amazing deacons or Marcus, someone will get a palm to you because um, in the solo, there will be the, the, the word Hosanna. And the invitation is when you hear Hosanna, we will wave the palm branches. Amen. 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 So um, we're extremely excited. And, and there's a kind of heaviness because today we will hear a good word. We will hear the gospel proclaimed from our very own Phil Kwambeck, who is retiring at the end of this semester. And so we celebrate you, and we will sit up under your voice, and we will hear the gospel proclaimed. And, and today's chapel is scheduled for 20 minutes, but I confess it will take as long as it takes because we will honor you. Those who cannot stay, go. But those who are, we invite you to stay and celebrate. And we also want to thank Deanna for her gift of voice and Sarah for her flute and always our amazing campus ministry, um, campus musician, Andrea. And so, Phil, August, Phil, this is Phil's chapel, and I'm going to invite you to stand because Phil wants us to invocate with Martin Luther's morning prayer. So please stand as you're able. And together we say, I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept us all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Come on, Deanna. Oh, 
from Luke. After he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you untying it, just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. Thank you, Ruth. I'm going to leave my phone on. I'm expecting a robocall from a company trying to sell me an extended warranty for my car. So <laughs> if it rings, I hope you understand that I'll answer. <laughs> I guess I'm not the only one. Let's pray. Gracious God, bless Babette on this wonderful celebration of her birthday. We give thanks for her ministry here and for this campus ministry. And bless us in our hearing and in our doing of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Sometimes something happens when you, uh, you learn something and things change the way you see the world. And what I've loved about teaching the Bible at Augsburg is part of my goal is I always want to see a new thing in a text. Always. A new twist. A new angle. Sometimes I get it from a book. Sometimes it just comes to me. And sometimes I hear it from students in class like Adam. Seriously. 
Thank you. But that's been part of the joy, is hearing the Bible, and it keeps it fresh. I'm going to identify three things that have been pivotal moments for me. I've new, not the only ones, but just things you'll illustrate. First of all, look at the screen. Anybody know where this sign is located? It's a test. It's right outside the door. <laughs> it's the kind of thing you see but never see. It's an early seal of the college or seminary and university because that's how Augsburg began. And when I got tenure, I felt a little relieved, so I took, I audited Norwegian for a semester. I wanted to know what my grandparents had been saying when they didn't want me to hear what they were saying. They spoke Norwegian to each other, though they'd never been to Norway. But I looked at that word, that blevshit. The word became flesh. And in three words, uh, in, in Nor I knew Nor German and the der die das, you have all the, but in Norwegian they put the article at the end of the word, so or det is the word, et. It's so lean, poetic, and if you know what it's saying, what are you going to say? And dwelt among us. Those were words that the founders of this college thought in those few words. It represented their origin, but I think it also represented where they were going. Or that blimp shit. Let's see, the next one. Okay, uh, these travelers got in the way of a nice photo of the Wartburg Castle in Germany. Now, I grew up like a good Lutheran confirmand, and I read all about the Wartburg Castle and how Luther was hidden there, uh, grew a beard, and was called a knight. But what struck me here. And this is what hit me then, that this is the place where in 11 weeks Luther translated the New Testament into German. This was a tectonic shift in Western civilization. And it happened in a room in this castle. I knew that, but it had never hit me that way before. And a colleague of Bruce gave us this great picture with the lightning. I think that captures what that's about. And this is a picture of the Temple Mount. But let me get those travelers, those pilgrims, out of the way. We took a group there in 2017. I was standing on, the, on my first trip to Israel in 2007. I took a week off from interim and went on a fam tour with a bunch of other clergy to get a quick tour so the travel agent could sell us on taking groups there. I was with a bunch of Pentecostals. It was really different. But I stood on the Mount of Olives and I looked at the city and something hit me. That Jesus, this was the view he would have had as he came over the hill. Behind him to the right would have been Bethany and Bethphage. And as he comes over, what's he going to see? The temple. Now, this is not the, the Jerusalem of Jesus' day. The Jerusalem of Jesus' day is buried under 18 feet of rubble that the Romans left behind. And the temple is gone, and the remnants of the temple is gone. But that level top, that's Herod's work. And the Dome of the Rock, for me, functions as a place where the temple might have been. And Jesus always came from the east. And he saw this view. And he never stayed overnight in the city, as far as the Gospels say. But he likes to go to Bethany. Today's reading of Luke begins on the Mount of Olives. How am I doing on time? I want to observe, I've always, I want to make sure we get out of here, but thanks, Babette, for a little flexibility. As a biblical scholar, I am the type uh, who's wary of taking the uh, Bible too literally. You know, you go out east and every sign says Washington slept here. Um, Jesus slept here. Jesus walked here. I've been cautious about people who think they know the historical Jesus too well, exactly what he said, how he felt. I once read a book on what Jesus ate, and the author was certain that Jesus ate free-range chicken. I'm waiting for that brand to come out. It makes sense. I don't think there was any other kind of chicken in Jesus' day. The Jerusalem of Jesus' day, as I mentioned, is gone. It's buried in rubble. The temple is gone. And it was probably gone when Luke wrote this gospel. There was no temple when Luke wrote about the temple. 
One stone was not left upon another in the Jew after the Jewish revolt of 70 CE. The Roman destruction of the temple in Jerusalem was certain. The walls of Jerusalem we see are more from the Ottoman Turks than from anybody prior to that. But the hilltop, as I said, is Herod's. Distinctive about this story, it occurs in all four Gospels. Now, you got, I should have a blackboard. You have Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic Gospels who share a dependent literary relationship. And then you got John. But they all tell this story. And they all tell the crucifixion story. The story is set during Passover week. The annual celebration of the last plague, the beginning of the Exodus, the movement from bondage to freedom in the history of the Israelites, and that's how it's still celebrated today. The Imperial Roman presence was not just in Palestine, but it was in Jerusalem, and it was a reminder there was, so to speak, yet another Pharaoh in town. Pilate was that Pharaoh's representative. Pilate was there to keep law and order on the frontier, and the atmosphere we can imagine was religiously and politically charged when Jesus rode into town. Pilate had come from Caesarea Maritima, which is a great spot on the Mediterranean Sea, and he had to go to Jerusalem, which is not a great spot this time of year. That must not have made Pilate very happy. Jesus had done a lot of walking, but here he needs a horse. Luke re reports he sends two disciples to find a colt on which to ride. Jesus had been tempted to say, a horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. But he didn't think the disciples would get the Shakespeare reference. <laughs> Jesus knew a lot, I'm sure. The imperial, uh, it is surprisingly a private scene when Jesus says, go find a guy with a horse. Take it, and if anybody asks you, tell them the Lord needs it. And then he says, okay. In Mark, they say, we'll bring it right back. But not in Luke. They just take the horse. And then they put coats on their horse and Jesus on the coats and they head down the hill and there are no palm branches in Luke's gospel, I was sorry to say. So it would be coat Sunday if all we had was Luke's telling of the story. Everybody throw your coats, wave your coats. There you go. Luke, for, and it's, it's John who makes, tells us it's palms. It seems the followers of Jesus who, uh, who should be blessed, uh, say the blessed is, they say blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. They're quoting Psalm 118, a Hallel Psalm associated with Passover. And boy, is that politically charged because how many kings can you have in this town? It was appropriate for Passover, but there was no king like Caesar. And to quote John Wayne, this town ain't big enough for two kings. But with blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, Luke also adds peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. If you know Luke's gospel, you've heard that before from the angels. There are two kinds of power. There's a power that destroys and that there's a power that serves and gives life. There's the power at the left, as Luther would say, and the power at the right. We look across that valley, the Kidron Valley today, and we look from occupied West Bank to a hilltop that is under the control of the Palestinian organization. And beyond that is the green line from the 1948 war. It's still a tense place this Jerusalem. We can see what empires in the imperially minded do to subjugate, and we're watching it now on our televisions. Mariupol on our screens and the devastation of Bukha. It's what empires, pharaohs, Caesars, czars, and Putins do. So what kind of king is a crucified king? The thief on the cross doesn't turn to Caesar for help, but he says to Jesus, Remember me. This king appeals not to our power, but to our weakness. This king shows us who God is 
not above us, but with us and among us. A word become flesh. And as Paul puts it, the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. Or maybe I should say, to you who are being saved, it is the power of God. Amen. We're going to offer you a blessing. I sit over here. Stand right. over here. Yes. Okay. We invite you all to just stretch your hands. A blessing is a circle of light drawn around a person to protect, heal, and strengthen. The beauty of a blessing is its belief that it can affect what unfolds, invoking the power and promise of the divine. We offer this blessing for the Dr. Reverend Philip Quanbeck II, Associate Professor of Religion, as he prepares to retire at the end of the semester. Phil, we're standing with you here at the waters of baptism, and as you know, that baptismal calling that you received continues with you now into your vocational journey as retirement. So hear these words um, adapted from pastors Maida Carlson and John O'Donohue here at the waters of baptism. The time has come for your daily work to change, to let go of titles, to stop striving and regretting a vocation stuffed into a career. Spread it out now. Unfold it slowly, smoothing the crease. Let it breathe a little and listen beyond the stern voices of responsibility and provision. You have more to share with the world new expressions of your generous self to discover. This is where your life has arrived after all the years of effort and toil. Look back with graciousness and thanks on all your great and quiet achievements. You stand on the shore of new invitation to open your life to what is left undone. You stand on the shore of new invitation. Let your heart enjoy a different rhythm when drawn to the wonder of other horizons. Have the courage for a new approach to time. Allow it to slow until you find freedom, to draw alongside the mystery you hold and befriend your own beauty of soul. Now is approaching the time to enjoy your heart's desire, to live the dreams you've waited for, to awaken the depths beyond your work, and enter into your infinite source. They will receive this prayer adapted from Martin Luther. <laughs> Almighty and eternal God, we pray that you would uphold Phil through the right knowledge of your divine word, through your Holy Spirit, grant him peace and health as he do the work of future callings with your blessing through your dear son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And together we say amen. 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 And we celebrate. <laughs>
elders, please stand for this dismissal. In you, Jesus shines brighter. In you, Jesus shines purer than all the angels in the sky. Now go and may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and may the Lord give you peace. Now and forever, please stay. Um, there are donuts. Uh, as you're able, please um, celebrate Dr. Phil with us. Go in peace. Love and serve your neighbor. Thank Amen. Thank you.